Welcome everyone, good afternoon to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. My name's Amy Burke and I'm the program director for the MedPeds program. And once a year we are asked to find a speaker that would be uh, appropriate for Grand Rounds. I am really excited today to introduce the two speakers who will be discussing such an important topic with us. Um, and I will, I will tell you a little bit more about Dr. Trulia, but let me start with the person he's brought along with him today to speak, who is a first year resident at Mount Sinai. Um, this is Dr. Amara Davidson. She was born and raised in the Harlem area of New York City and graduated from the University of Miami, um, majoring in international studies and economics. Uh, she thought she would have a career as a U.S. diplomat after a summer internship uh, in the office of Congressman Charlie Rangel. However, she grew up in a family of physicians and the call was great. Um, and so she found herself uh, joining the uh, Howard University School of Medicine. As a medical student, she volunteered at the student-run free clinic at the New Freedmen's Clinic and combined her love of running and uh, people as a volunteer with the Achilles International. She's now a PGY1 in the Combined Internal Med Peds program at Mount Sinai in New York, and we're really excited to have you back to Washington for this talk. Um, Dr. Joe Trulio is a brilliant and empathic person who has always had an interest in ways to reduce inequities in marginalized and oppressed populations. He was drawn to the excellent academic tradition of the Georgetown Jesuits for his undergraduate degree, where he completed a dual major in theology and biology. He stayed at the Georgetown School of Medicine, and this is where Dr. Mike Donnelly and I had the good fortune to meet him as a student AI when he rotated in our MedPeds clinic many moons ago. For his MedPeds training, he went to New York at Mount Sinai, where he really developed his clinical interest in caring for medically complex children and young adults with special health care needs. He joined the faculty at Sinai, and upon completion of his training, developed the visitors doc Visiting Doctors in Complex Care program. It's a really innovative, it's a whole nother mid-peeds uh, grand rounds talk about complex uh, care of complex patients, both children and young adults in the home setting with a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and it's really interesting work. His academic interests for the last decade have been focusing on sort of reformatting the mid-peeds residency at Sinai to specifically train leaders in primary care committed to serving vulnerable populations. He has written and presented on anti-racial clinical skills spirituality in medicine, expanding mental health access in primary care, refugee health, and LGBTQ health. Um, as a point of reference for this talk, which is such an important um, to our all of our interest as medical educators on anti-racism in medicine, he was actually scheduled to give this talk on April 2nd last year, which obviously was uh, waylaid when we were in the beginnings of the corona pandemic and not yet doing virtual grand rounds. Um, but he's, it's something he's been passionate about and studying and speaking to even before the tumultuous events of last summer, but even more uh, timely perhaps to, to, as we are really trying to take action here at MedStar in Georgetown to address these important topics. Um, beyond that, I can tell you about his mean skills at the karaoke mic, but that's, that's another day as well. So excited to see everyone here. Know there's folks from internal medicine, pediatrics, med peds, radiology, psychiatry, the health policy elective and, and others. So we're really excited to have a diverse group of people here to appreciate what you two are going to share with us. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Amy. And thanks again for, for having us. I do wish we were able to be there in person, but I appreciate us being able to move forward with this talk. And hopefully it's really the beginning of a conversation um, that's broader than just this one hour. Um, and, you know, we'll include other institutions from around the country. There's a lot of folks um, being increasingly engaged um, in this work. So hopefully this just um, kicks off a lot of uh, conversation and thought and action. Um, I always like to start our talk um, with acknowledgments because we always run out of time. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the history. Amy mentioned, you know, this is work that we've been engaged in for years. Um, but I think, you know, for me personally, um, you know, almost a decade ago when, you know, teaching at our med school um, in our clinical skills course, um, you know, I still remember being approached by some students who sort of just brought it up and said, you know, I know you are very dedicated to social justice, but the way your course teaches about race and inequities just perpetuates uh, racism. And, you know, as, a, as someone, you know, who felt I was in medicine to sort of reduce these sorts of inequities, um, I had to sort of sit with that. 
And I think historically at our institution, as is the case at many institutions, this work has been driven um, oftentimes by students and trainees for better or worse, and oftentimes um, by black and brown individuals. And at our institution, it was predominantly by black women. And I think it's important to recognize that history and also the many folks who are students, doc, uh, you know, residents, uh, educators at Sinai and around the country. And I know Amara has um, some uh, mentors and, and family members she'd like to also recognize. Oh, just Dr. Sarah Baden, who I went to um, medical school with and also actually was family medicine resident here at Mount Sinai and on a daily basis is just encouraging me to continue to do this type of work. And then also to my father, um, Dr. Ronald Davidson, just to, um, an honor to continue his legacy, especially with being here and working with um, Dr. Trulio in um, home visits. We have no conflicts of interest. Um, so I liked, um, you know, I know this is a medicine grand rounds, but I understand there's a lot of folks in the um, MedPeds people and folks from other departments. Um, so I think these data, while to do with infant mortality, um, do speak to the health um, of individuals and communities in our country broadly. And honestly, you know, you could superimpose almost any health outcome here. And I like to start these uh, sessions looking at these sorts of data not because we haven't seen them before, but to really keep our mind while we're going through a lot of terms and um, you know, thoughts and uh, theories and skills, really to sort of keep our minds focused on why we're doing this and keep our minds focused on outcome. Um, we should recognize as the quote goes, right, that every system is perfectly designed to give you the results it does. Um, so these are the results that our healthcare system in this country produces where if you are a black woman um, with an advanced degree, you are more likely to have your child die as an infant than if you are a white woman with less than an eighth grade education. Um, so we have to sort of pause and ask ourselves, like what is the system that produces these outcomes and why does it produce these outcomes? And then to recognize that, you know, in both medicine and medical education, there is no neutrality. If we show up to work every day and do what we've been doing, we are contributing to the system that produces these inequities. And so we wanna take a pause and, and sort of deconstruct a little bit the not individual isolated incidents, not even patterns, but really start to think about what's the culture um, that, that perpetuates uh, these sorts of outcomes. So, okay. uh, yes. So by the end of this session, we're hoping that you'll be able to discuss the ways by which white supremacy culture drives health inequities, describe a framework for anti-racist clinical skills, and enumerate techniques to foster anti-racist and anti-oppressive culture in medical education. Um, so, you know, the title of the talk is Anti-Racism in, in Medical Education. Um, I think as a sort of grounding principle, one of the things I like to mention is anti-racism is not something you are. Um, you don't become anti-racist. Your system doesn't become anti-racist. It's something you do, right? So it's an observable, modifiable uh, behavior um, and one that sort of addresses policies and practices. So throughout the talk, we just want to be just very concrete and it, it makes it actually simpler to have this discussion as opposed to sort of when do you cross some imaginary line um, and become quote unquote anti-racist. Anti um, so let's take a step back and before we talk about racism or anti-racism, let's just talk briefly about culture. Um, and I think just thinking very broadly about culture as a word, as neither sort of, you know, a positive nor negative attribute. Um, and if folks, I don't know if you have the chat feature open. Um, I tried to do Slido, but I'm not technologically advanced. Um, so yeah, throw into the chat feature, just when you hear the word culture, what are the sort of things that come to mind? Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, for those who know me, not surprisingly, it's all about food. Um, so when you hear culture, what are the things that come to your mind? And you could do them to everyone. You can do them just to me and I can read them out. 
So we've got tradition, lifestyle, socially created, set of norms, taboo, a unifying way of thinking. So you can have a look through the things in the chat and you know, there's a wide variety of things that are very concrete. Um, some things that are more theoretical, some things that are positive, some things that perhaps have a negative connotation around stereotypes, for example. Um, but I think if you think about your dominant culture, and folks in med peds know this pretty well, switching from medicine to peds to medicine to peds, but imagine anytime you've ever gone traveling to another country for a while, and then you come back to your hometown, there's probably things you notice about your hometown you've never noticed before. And that's because when you're in a culture and surrounded by it, um, it becomes invisible. It's like fish don't know that they're wet. They definitely know when you take them out of the water, but they don't know that they're wet, that they're swimming around in water. And we don't know, we don't really recognize the culture that we're living in until we really start to critically think about it. And that invisible nature is one thing that gives culture its power. So what we want to do when we start to think about deconstructing or dismantling a culture that results in racial inequities is to start to examine that culture itself and start to think about what that means and what it looks like. Um, and the culture that I'm talking about is white supremacy culture. And I think a lot of times, um, actually, you know, it's our conversations have changed over the last few years. A few years ago when we would you know, approach this topic, most folks thought about white supremacy culture as to do with just extremist activity and behavior. Um, whereas I think today there's a general, uh, a little bit more of a general understanding of this concept. But let's take a step back and sort of walk through why this applies to our day-to-day -day life in medicine. So first, let's think about racism. Uh, there's a lot of different definitions around racism. Kamar Jones um, has one that I think works quite well in this uh, conversation. And that is racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning values based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we would call race. Um, so the next uh, line in the string is that racist policies and practices provide this structure and are any policy or practice that regardless of intent results in a shift in power, privilege, and opportunity towards those called white. Racist policies and practices, in turn, are supported by the hierarchy, values, beliefs, and norms of a predominantly white culture. This hierarchy, values, beliefs, and norms are what we call white supremacy culture. So that's how we sort of connect these together. And why it matters is we all either perpetuate white supremacy culture through action or inaction, or disrupt white supremacy culture through intentional actions. So if, if out of the whole hour, we remember just a couple of general concepts, I think the two are that when we think about anti-racism and where our focus of effort should be, it's around identifying those policies and practices that produce racial inequities. And it doesn't matter the intent or sort of the history of why they were developed. Um, we look purely at the relationship between a policy or practice, be it something big and way above our pay grade or something that we do day to day and its actual outcomes. And that the, the current norm is the white supremacy culture that perpetuates those policies and practices that produce the outcomes we see day to day and we know very, very well. So that if we show up in the clinical or educational space and just go through our business, we're continuing to perpetuate those policies and practices. So what anti-racism in medical education looks like is intentional actions that disrupt those cultural norms. So we've spoken a lot about culture and cultural norms, um, and I want to spend a little time sort of talking specifically about white supremacy cultural norms and what those are. Um, and then we'll sort of pause because we've gone through a lot and have a bit of a conversation. But first thing is if you have a QR, if you have your phone, you can just sort of hold it up to the QR code. Um, and it's gonna bring you to a document by Tema Okun, who's one of our colleagues who does a lot of work around white supremacy culture out at Duke. And we've worked with her to sort of, to start to apply this framework to clinical practice and to medical education. You can also go to that website and pull up some of these, but 
These are the cultural norms when we say um, white supremacy culture. A few years ago when I first started, you know, learning about this and engaging with it, I was a little bit confused um, and a little bit sort of resistant because I was thinking to myself, like if we look at some of these, right, either or thinking, um, I'm like, what do you mean that's a white supremacy cultural norm? That's sort of the reality, right? Like I'm either going to pass my boards or fail them. My patient's either adherent to their medication or they're not. Um, a resident either matches here or they don't. Um, someone's either racist or they're not racist, right? A statement, you know, we hear it in the news all the time, right? Someone says a statement, was that statement racist or not? And that's either or thinking. And to me, that was sort of the way things were. Worship of the written word, of course, we value um, the written word. We value publications, we value data. Um, this is science, right? Um, so these are the basic tenets, though. And when I, what, the more that I engaged in this, these concepts, the more it became clear that these things seem natural to me because this is our culture. And regardless of our own either identity or perceived identity, we all participate um, in this culture that has produced the outcomes we see. And if you look through the document, it actually becomes a little clearer when we think about power hoarding, for example, um, you know, there's a general sense that there's only a certain amount of power to go around. And if we share it, uh, we lose some of that power and other people then have that power. And that's how a particularly deeply hierarchical structures like medicine and medical education are generally structured. Um, so I encourage you, you know, to look through that document and then we're going to have a little bit of a conversation, but read through some of them that are in the, uh, the QR code. Um, and I'll give everyone a minute just to reflect on them. And then we're going to have a prompt that you can either unmute and chat or just throw it up into the, the chat feature. But take a minute just to look through some of them. Okay, so now that everyone's been able to maybe look at it for a little, a little bit, um, think of one norm that resonates with you. So I'll start. Um, when I when I look at these white supremacy cultures, I think of like quality versus quantity, and also um, the power of the written word. And um, the next question will be, how does this manifest in your day to day practice? So for me, as a resident, um, getting feedback is kind of what PGY one is all about and being open to that feedback. Um, consistently, um, I'm told that I have, I'm great with patients. I'm a good connector. People seem to um, feel very comfortable talking with me. Um, and then after that, it's like, but your, your medical knowledge needs to improve. And for me, I have grown in a culture that I, I, don't, I, I don't appreciate the value that can be seen in connecting with people. Because for me, I understand the value is being able to cite articles or how much have you published, um, what's the latest data on this, and being able to present that quickly and in the appropriate situations um, during rounding. Um, and I've just learned recently that this is just that I that it's this is something that's inherent into just the training of medical education. So feel free to reflect in a similar way and either unmute if you can and share or you can put it in the chat um, and it could be to everyone or if you want to remain anonymous you can do it just to me and then i can share it um, i see someone has put up um, objectivity and the invalidation of people's feelings who are not viewed as objective for example folks from women or or other cultures 
So thank you for sharing that. Uh, so you see objectivity as sort of manifesting day to day in the way we interact with our patients and perhaps even our colleagues. So Vian has shared worship of the written word, particularly in its um, role in, in the constitution as fundamentally racist in creation and used to defend hate speech. Fear of open conflict prevents us from addressing racist comments or behaviors from patients or colleagues. Sense of urgency pervades the culture of medicine, particularly academic medicine. I think everyone, everyone always recognizes the sense of urgency. I mean, that one, I did it, we did this for the hospitalists last week and it's like, they get 10 emails a day to discharge everyone by 11 o'clock. So there's clearly a sense of urgency in their work. So start to think in a very concrete way how you see these things, not just as, okay, I've noticed this, but how do these things actually support or create very concrete um, policies and practices at your institution that you see impact patients? And then think about your sphere of influence. And just important, um, an example was power hoarding being a big problem in medicine. Um, the same, usually white people, probably white men, small group of people holding all of the leadership positions. Um, the concept of right to comfort in the conjunction with the phrase used of the late, um, peace does not equal justice. I think the right to comfort is something that we probably all have experienced um, on rounds. Something was said that was inappropriate about a patient. Maybe you chuckled, but knew internally that that wasn't something that was funny. Um, making a joke, a, a looking at a patient and thinking that um, something negative and, and, and not approaching the room um, and saying something. Cause you're like, I don't want to shake them. I don't want to make people upset. I don't, I don't want to be different. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea that we can be silent is, is a privilege. And, and healthcare, it doesn't change if, we, if we're all silent. So thank you all for sharing these, and I'm sure there's more you can reflect on. Um, we're gonna spend some time now um, sort of going through in a very concrete way, how these norms manifest in different aspects of medical education and what we can do concretely to either develop skills or policies that disrupt them. Um, so when, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice what is involved in medical education, but we've thought of a few sort of four buckets um, that we use to approach our anti-racism work in medical education. So we think about program structure, relationships, curriculum, and faculty development. Now, clearly there's other ways you can do this, and clearly these overlap, but these were an easier way for us to sort of start to ask ourselves questions about our program. And, and to what extent we are perpetuating these white supremacy norms and to what extent we have opportunities to disrupt them. Um, so for program structure, for example, at a very foundational level, who decides that we're gonna have a program? Who decides our program's mission and design? And then does, does our, do our recruitment goals uh, and curriculum, do they reflect that mission? Um, and what voices are represented in our program power structures and which ones are not. So we'll explore that in a little more detail. Um, relationships. Is power explicitly recognized in interpersonal and program community relationships? You know, do we talk about the impact of a residency training program in a community health center in East Harlem on the community? Um, the positive and the negative and the ways in which power is either shared or hoarded in those relationships? Um, is the racist ecosystem within which relationships exist recognized and challenged? And this could be everything from high level program decisions to individual mentorship, um, from faculty to residents, from residents to students, particularly white faculty towards residents and students of color. Um, is that ecosystem discussed in those relationships and are people equipped um, to do so? From a curricular perspective, this is the other one of the two that will uh, do a little bit more of a deep dive. 
Um, but are the anti-racist knowledge and skills developed to meet specific competencies? And are those competencies related to the program mission, right? Who decides what we're spending time learning about? And are these sort of discrete siloed concepts or is this part of the program culture um, and sort of uh, delivered um, universally or more reactionary? And then finally, uh, we won't go into this one too much, but I think it's worth mentioning at least here, faculty and faculty development. So when we think about anti-racist work, is this ubiquitous or is it something that talks about racism occasionally, right? Or is every faculty expected um, to do this work? Is faculty time for development and anti-racist skills valued? Is it compensated? Um, are white faculty developed on how to mentor trainees of color? And are the expectations for anti-racism distributed equitably across faculty? Or is there a burden but based on faculty of color? So one of the recurring themes of this talk is to think about spheres of influence. So the reason we're gonna spend the rest of the time on program structure and curriculum is that that generally impacts all of us in some way. But you know, if you find yourself in a position where relationships is something that you can have an impact on, I encourage you to reflect on these questions. If you know, you're a chair or a dean or a program director, you know, I'd encourage you to think about the faculty development piece, for example, and the structure and culture of expectations within your sphere of influence, remembering that that culture is either racist or anti-racist, and there is no middle ground. Um, so how do we sort of critically self-reflect um, in these areas is sort of the first step when we start to talk about uh, anti-racism in medical education. Um, Someone actually jumped in a question. Um, I know we moved past this, but it relates to worship of the written word and that there is a strong notion that there is an appropriate channel of reporting wrong actions and words and that pointing these things out on rounds, for example, is quote inappropriate. So that's an awesome uh, segue. And we will talk about that in the curriculum because we actually talk about effective ways to discuss these things on rounds. But generally, um, you know, it, folks in leadership, right, we don't really get to tell people um, how to resist oppression. That's not really our role, right? So when things, are when things happen and come up, um, th this could be with regards to faculty development or evaluations or something happening on rounds. We have to think about our, um, our response to that as an individual, as a team, is either gonna reduce or increase a racial inequity. And I think when we think about that, um, framework, it'll help us figure out the right path forward. So I appreciate that question. Um, so we're going to spend some time now talking about program structure. Um, program structure involves a lot of these norms, but predominantly power. Um, and, and the aim is to shift power in residency recruitment and training away solely from the academic medical center to the patients and communities that will be cared for by and participate in the training of residents. So what does that actually look like? Um, there's a, a lot of different components when you think about program structure, but the four big um, areas of a program that the structure impacts is the mission, recruitment, curriculum, and evaluation. Um, so for our program, um, when we actually decided to, to restart our MedPeds program, um, we had this in mind and we were thinking about power. So we had a meeting with folks throughout the hospital system, uh, but also throughout the community, patients, community leaders, uh, chaplains, um, faith leaders, you know, community health workers, to try to get at two things, right? So like, what, what should the mission of this program be? And also, what should, the, what should the doctors we recruit represent? Like, what does a good doctor look like to you? Um, and that board came up with our mission statement, um, which has, you know, the sort of dual focus of primary care and social justice. Um, but it also led to sort of a lot of our processes around residency recruitment to make sure that our recruitment reflects those values and our evaluation to make sure that when we evaluate our program, um, we're reflecting those values. And we had it a little bit easier because we're a primary care program. Um, but you could imagine this, this structure works the same way, even if you're an interventional radiology program. It's hard to argue that, you know, only in primary care or sort of related type fields do the individuals that participate in the program from the community that are cared for by the trainees should have power 
in how those programs are operated and how they run. Um, so we can all think to ourselves, in what ways does our program hoard power? In what ways do we share power? And I think when we think about um, power hoarding as a concept, it's perpetuated by the false belief that there's a limited amount of power, um, as opposed to by power sharing, we actually increase the total amount of power at play and make ourselves more effective at, at achieving our stated goals. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our structure and then Amara is gonna share some of her experiences. I think it shows a very concrete way how involving patients and power sharing throughout our community has actually made us more effective at doing what we're trying to do. Um, so I spoke a little bit about how we approached generating our mission. Now I'll talk a little bit about our work with the re recruitment process. So this came from um, the, our, our brief report in SGM Forum about how we sort of build on a holistic review process towards anti-racist review process. Um, and the first step is, you know, in holistic review selections, they, they start off with the selections criteria, um, that they're broad-based, clearly linked to school missions and goals and promote diversity. But in an anti-racist approach, we think, well, who decides that mission upon which the selections criteria are based? Um, when we think about measuring experience attributes and academic metrics, um, in an anti-racist approach, we explicitly prioritize the stated values of the patients and community. And we also try to eliminate those metrics that perpetuate structural racism and unearned privilege. When we move down further and think about um, the, uh, uh, in the holistic review process, how we would individualize consideration um, to each applicant, um, how that may contribute to the learning environment and practice of medicine and balance the range of criteria needed in a class to achieve the outcomes desired by a school. And that when they think about race and ethnicity um, only being considered when narrowly tailored to achieve mission related educational interests, um, we sort of shift and pivot that a bit to think about individual and structural racism explicitly throughout the assessment, both in terms of oppression and privilege. We also have to recognize the challenges of white administration, staff, committee members, including myself, in identifying and valuing the contributions of applicants of color. Um, and then power and privilege amongst applicants, faculty, and community are universally considered and explicitly discussed in the program design and while making recruitment decisions. So in very concrete ways, what did we do? Um, the first was, as I already mentioned, our mission statement was developed in collaboration with community and patients, and that our metrics then follow from that. Someone mentioned AOA, there were only um, two minorities and none were black. So there's actually some of our students published on this a few years ago. Um, and for that reason, amongst others, you know, we, we blind AOA, uh, we blind board scores, and we de-emphasize clerkship grades that can often represent um, subjective evaluations and uh, implicit racism. And we de-emphasize their schools, which are also a product of, you know, generations and decades of structural racism in the U.S. education system. For us, primary care and social justice were our dual priorities, but any program, you might have different priorities. If you're a research program, you're going to have different priorities, but those priorities and how they're evaluated should stem not just from those in power. Um, and then our recruitment committee reflected power sharing and included physicians, social workers, nurses, chaplains, patients, and community leaders. Um, and we have st extensive development on anti-oppressive um, anti techniques. So I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but first, oh, wait, can you outline some of those metrics? Yeah, exactly. So um, yes, and I am going to get to it on the next slide. Very good. So when uh, the first time that we uh, did our recruitment, we did all this work. Um, and then I looked at our list and it was, to be very clear, like a bunch of white people from really great schools in the top 20. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, because we really didn't dig in deep to how we were in the moment allowing the things that were our culture from impacting us moment to moment. So we sort of went back to the drawing board, did a lot more training, did a lot more um, work interperson, how to interrupt these dynamics in the moment, and even went down to the way our evaluation form was written. 
So in our original form, we had a, the, the typical, you know, review committee form that had the name, are they going to couples match, what school are they from, what were their, you know, their grades, what were their publications. And then we worked our way down to like extracurriculars, et cetera. What we did in the revised version was we flipped it. So at the top of our evaluation form, we have the things that our community told us were important. So the evidence of dedication to primary care and the evidence of dedication to social justice. Now, how you actually evaluate these are more complicated um, than I'd like them to be. You know, if you're someone who um, is coming from a family where you have a social and financial obligation to care for a loved one, you're going to have a little less time to go off during spring break to do some global health work, right? So your CV might not look traditionally as strong. Um, but by having multiple people, including non-physicians and patients and community members evaluate applicants, we're able to get a little deeper into what this, what a dedication to social justice, what dedication to community, what dedication to primary care actually looks like. Then we put our um, academic evaluation on the bottom. Um, and the way I, I, when we do our workshops, I sort of talk about this is, um, this is almost like when, for the medicine folks in the room, uh, when we do like a uh, perioperative evaluation, right? We don't ever clear anyone for surgery. We estimate a perioperative risk. Um, so what we're doing here is we're not trying to create a hierarchy of academic success amongst our applicants. What we're trying to figure out is as a program, can we support academically the folks we're recruiting? And we're gonna look at them and in the, in the context of everything that was happening in this person's life, are they likely to excel academically at Mount Sinai? Might they need some support? Or are they likely to struggle and need a lot of support? Um, and perhaps maybe the, you know, our, our hospital's environment isn't the best place for this applicant. Or perhaps it can be with the right support, in which case we need to decide as a program and as an institution, can we support them? Because it's not about taking the people who have had all of the you know, right resources for the last 35 years and sort of continuing them on that trajectory. It's about identifying people who are dedicated to the mission and the metrics, you know, that our community said was important. Um, so when we have structured our approach this way, um, we had a very different looking list um, and one that really actually reflected the values of our community. Then it's the way we discuss them. So um, I mentioned this is very much to do with culture, right? And that culture exists in our recruitment meeting. In our very first recruitment meeting, it was me, um, the pre categorical program directors, and the vice chairs of education for both departments, all at the head of the table, all white men, um, leading a discussion you know, around these applicants. Um, so we also had to sort of go back to the drawing board about that, and we did a lot of training around anti-oppressive skills. And this is from uh, modified a bit from a group called Aorta. Um, and they have a wonderful website. They have some free materials. They have uh, training sessions folks can go to. Um, it's, this work really focuses around small group facilitation. We've modified a lot of this content, um, laid over our white supremacy norms framework, and now apply this both to our work in talking about applicants and also our work in um, training folks how to round um, and how to use anti-oppressive skills at the bedside. Um, so, what the anti-oppressive skills do is they sort of help you focus on naming and interrupting social power dynamics. The rest of the bullet points are there. Uh, so I want to give a couple of examples and there's some stuff in the chat and then we're, we'll do questions. So one example is power hoarding, right? So we have all been in this situation where, you know, individuals with traditional power in society, folks who look like me, speak more and are recognized more than others, interrupt others or restate what others have said. So one of the core concepts in anti-oppressive facilitation techniques is a very simple one. And this is the one we, all, we often um, encourage our faculty and residents to start with, is just name what you see. Um, so, you know, an example might be, you know, I've noticed that a lot of comments um, get restated by men before they're acknowledged by the group. And just saying that, pointing out the culture um, that everyone is swimming in and doesn't see, like, hey, fish, we're all wet. Um, suddenly, it changes the tone of the conversation. Um, you know, in a very concrete way, you know, in education, we often do the what if, right? You know, so when you're precepting and a resident really knows everything, well, okay, you know, smarty pants, what if the person had this 
potassium and then see if they know what to do. In anti-oppressive facilitation techniques, we can sort of expose unspoken biases by sort of changing characteristics. So we had an applicant um, recently that was sort of being critiqued for doing a lot of good stuff and sort of, you know, is this person climbing a social ladder, for example, you know, like uh, playing the game, et cetera. And one of our um, non-physician um, participants just said, I'm going to ask the question that I've been asking myself, would we be having these concerns if this applicant were a man? Um, and then it sort of changed the conversation. On rounds, you can ask, you know, would our thoughts about this patient be different if they were white and not black? Um, at what point did we decide to call ACS with this family? Would we've had this conversation if this were a white family? Um, and leaders on the team can do that, but students can do that as well. Um, so by training our team in these techniques, we're able to sort of get to those norms, um, talk about when power hoarding is happening, overcome the right to comfort, um, overcome either or thinking by using systems um, and complex thinking, uh, for example. Um, some of this other work are things we use in, on rounds and not necessarily in our, in, our, um, in our committees, but I'd like to open it up for questions. But before that, Amara has participated actually in both our program evaluation committee and our recruitment committee um, and can share a little bit about her experiences as a trainee participating in this. Um, so I think also I should note that I grew up in a family where my father would barter with his patients if he couldn't it couldn't afford um to pay him for the care so my understanding of like knowing what the community wants that you're serving has always been very important to me i think something powerful happens to your field of medicine when you have people at the table with you that you are serving um yeah so for me doing the um committee evaluations one of the community members when asking like what's important to her as far as in the second year of our residency program, her point was that, well, I wanna know what you guys do for your wellness, because I wanna make sure that my physician is taking care of themselves well before they come and take care of me. And the idea that um, that's important to someone that we're serving, uh, I think was startling to some people, but also very important because who would you want to take care of you that wasn't taking care of yourself? Like a very basic concept that as probably people in other industries understand, but as physicians, we don't get that. So the fact that that was important to her, I just, it shifted the energy in the room. Now, mm -hmm. during our um, evaluations for uh, future residents, a community member mentioned, it's like, we're, I think we're in the weeds sometimes as residents and program directors looking at what's important this person went there to do that for their, their mission program, or um, does this person really wanna be in New York City? But after describing this applicant and, and what she's experienced, what the community member took away with was, sounds like whatever she meets in life, she will be able to conquer. And when she framed it that way, it was like, wow, how could I not want this individual next to me, training with me at this program? Um, so the power of having people that you serve really just it it'll it it brings new ideas and concepts that we're, we, you just would not think of, especially if you don't look like them, especially if you don't live in that community and, and haven't really been invested in seeing that community grow. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Mara. Um, so before we move on to the curriculum piece, like what questions do folks have? I see someone in the chat, and I don't know who's on the call that can maybe speak to it, um, sort of any plans at Georgetown as far as uh, the representation of minorities selected for AOA. I'll say at Sinai, um, we did a lot of work at improving that, and we weren't able to, which is why we don't have AOA anymore because the sort of structures of racism were so embedded in all of the things that led up to that selection, we couldn't fix it. Um, but I'd, it'd be I don't know if anyone's on the call who can sort of speak to any efforts going on there. Hey, this is Sean Wilton. We have reviewed our AOA process and we've, we've struggled with uh, that issue precisely because 
if you're basing selection on grades and if grades in any way are influenced um, or part of, uh, you know, involved in these issues, then you just end up having that as an amplifier. That's one concern. Another concern is, do you, do you change the entire way that you select for AOA? And that's something that at the national level has been discussed um, because they do, you know, people do want to have an honor society. And um, so it, it's not, it, it's really a national discussion on trying to uh, get things to move in a, in a positive direction. Thank you, Dr. Welton. And it is, I would like to say, it's also very institution specific. It's one thing for a Sinai in Georgetown to say, perhaps, oh, you know, we're not going to do AOA. But I was doing one of these workshops at a relatively new medical school that was majority minority, predominantly first generation. And the concept of them not having AOA would be detrimental to a lot of their, their students applying for residency programs, because that's still what's valued. Um, but I would say that the conversation is an incredibly important one, but being able to like name what's actually happening. Um, and it sounds like, you know, a lot of the work Dr. Welton's doing is sort of getting, you know, at, at that, even if there's not a clear answer. Um, this, uh, there's another question um, about uh, how do you approach institutional leadership that doesn't want to share power? Um, is there a clear, there, there can be a clear power dynamic um, where people are in leadership, it could be in attending, it could be whoever, right, are able to affect, affect the futures of trainees in terms of residency applications for medical students um, or finishing residency fellowship as residents, et cetera. Um, this is a very hard uh, um, situation. And on one practical level, there's a group of us um, at Sinai, but also nationally, um, that have started to try to form a little bit of an informal group whereby students who feel um, that there might be retribution um, for their advocacy work. In New York, this actually started around some efforts, uh, particularly at Sinai, around gender equity, um, and students are speaking up and fearing retribution, that we actually have a network of program directors in different specialties that can be there to mentor and support those students. So that if they can't find support within their own teams or their own institutions, um, there's at least national uh, support uh, for these students. I think it's obviously a highly individualized decision and at some point you may find yourself, like in any situation, um, even as an attending or even as someone in leadership, you know, um, that you're deciding between advocating for a patient and putting yourself at risk. And as a clinician, um, the way you practice as a student will be the way you practice as an attending. And those decisions are ones you're going to have to make. Um, you know, even the people who you look like you might look at, you know, the MedPeds folks probably look at Dr. Burke like she has all the power in the world, but I'm pretty sure she makes tough decisions and puts herself at risk. Um, and, you know, that's in a very similar way. It might not be for an honors in a course, but it might be for a promotion um, or, or, you know, a schedule issue, right? So um, I think having those conversations and having mentors what you can turn to to help make those decisions is critical. And I think I saw Dr. Mitchell uh, on mute. Joe, welcome Wonderful home. to see you. Welcome home. We're very proud of, of all that you've done. I, and I just echo what Dr. Welton brought up. I think we've wrestled with this and many of the clerkship directors with, who are on the call now for this pandemic year, uh, making uh, clerkship grades. Uh, you know, we always sort of use those grades on third year, but they were also biased um, and uh, so, uh, there's a lot of work going on now, not only for clerks, clerkships are pass fail and AOA is suspended for the year. And it may at some point, I don't know, it would be up to the, to the chapter to make that decision, whether it's the, it's um, just what your institution did. But um, there's an article in um, um, academic medicine from the University of Chicago with Holly Humphrey there looking at holistic review to do that. And I, I know there's effort going on now through the Office of Med Ed to look at our dean's letters and say, what's the holistic review there? How do you, how do you really 
give students credit if they are exceptional students and how does that not incorporate the uh, the bias. So I think once you start tinkering with mm -hmm. that culture, you find that there's so many things that have to change. AOA is one of them, the, the Dean's letters going out, or the MSPE, um, and then recruiting. We, the challenge for us recruiting wise has been that it, it's an expensive school. So I think there are a number of folks who are working hard as we can to, to really create better um, financial support for underrepresented students and disadvantaged students coming in the door. So we have work to do. But I think you, as you said early on, acknowledging that the work is there, I think is at least a step. You know, that's absolutely right. And I appreciate, as you mentioned, you know, and as we saw earlier, so many of the techniques often involve just sort of recognizing and naming what's happening. Because until you, it's like anything in medicine, you can't treat when you don't have a diagnosis. Um, and sometimes we just jump, we, we're responding to a symptom of, of the, what AOA representation looks like, as opposed to finding the diagnosis of the white supremacy norms that have created that structure. Um, and in the last 10 minutes, I want to just show, and then, you know, it'll take two minutes to show it, and then we can just have a discussion a little bit about um, the curriculum. I did have a couple of cases and I, we won't do them. I just want to show a couple of things. I think they're really important. And there's students and residents on the call that probably are a little more interested in clinical work. Um, our curriculum's framework for anti-racist clinical skills now, shifting towards like how you take care of patients. There's a few different frameworks. This is one of them. And when it comes down to it is, is very similar to the way we approach inequities in educational outcomes. Remember that you cannot get from race to inequity without racism. And that the focus as a clinician should be on the consequences, not the intent of policies and practices. And that we then link those racist policies and practices to the white supremacy norms that perpetuate them. And that's where we develop and deploy our anti-racist clinical skill. So we were going to workshop this out if this were like a four hour uh, noon conference. Um, but when we think about end stage renal disease, right, there's a lot of things that contribute to it. And a lot of folks are probably familiar with like structural competency, where you look at the structures and systems at play. And one, mo one, mo one model that can show some things that contribute to end-stage renal disease might look at segregated care, like where can patients go to get care? Scientific racism, in this case, around believing people's symptoms, around um, the use of the race coefficient in estimated GFR. Um, and then it might be about you know, clinician implicit racism. Um, or explicit racism. But we think, um, how do you actually dismantle these? You need to get at the white supremacy norms that perpetuate them and then develop anti-racist skills um, to disrupt them. So what are the anti-racist bedside skills that can disrupt power hoarding that can impact where a patient can get care? Um, how do you advocate for integrated care? Um, how do you critically appraise an article's use of race um, to disrupt uh, power share, uh, to disrupt supremacy of the written, written word and scientific racism. How do you communicate with a patient about their experiences of illness and racism so that it's not just the people who do the writing that get to have a say in how a disease is diagnosed and treated? And then how do you recognize and disrupt clinician implicit racism? Um, so this is one tool which we can share. This is the tool, we, there's a whole workshop on how to appraise uh, uh, an article's use of race. Um, then we can spend some time talking about implicit bias and how that manifests in the clinical encounter. Um, but what does it look like when a resident actually, and this answers some of the questions from earlier, like what can you say, what can you do? Um, the five micro skills, some of the educators are probably familiar with it. This is like how you precept, right? What do you think is going on? What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? You can use these as an educator or even as a student or a resident at the bedside to interrupt some of these processes when you see them. And here's an example. When you hear um, something that you think or when you're trying to figure out the speaker, get them to verbalize their thoughts or ask questions about self-inquiry, a student can very easily ask, walk me through your reasoning here. You know, Amara was told recently not to transfuse a black patient um, with a hemoglobin of six because black patients donate blood less often and therefore she might get blood from a white patient and be more likely to develop antibodies. 
And when you're sort of recovering from the shock of that statement, being able to say, can you just walk me through your reasoning here, sort of gets the person to verbalize their thoughts um, and maybe engage in some self-inquiry. And then um, you can identify the dominant narratives that play. I said some of these earlier, when we come to the same decision of this person were white, um, are there characteristics of the patient that can be influenced our clinical reasoning here? And then lastly, what are the data supporting our clinical decisions? Um, and then lastly, someone asked earlier about um, the sort of anti-racist competencies. There's a group of MedPeds uh, program directors, yay MedPeds, who are looking at uh, putting together specific anti-racist competencies, actually as they would apply to all competencies. Um, but the, this, these are sort of excerpts from, uh, we made a Google form so we can put it up on our phone um, so that residents can self-reflect or we can observe residents about observable anti-racist clinical skills. Um, so, you know, we had a patient yesterday in the practice who have come in with their six-year-old after visiting two EDs in 24 hours for abdominal pain, knowing the history of racism and pain in our system and that data show that clinicians have false beliefs about biological differences in pain and that we actually treat children with appendicitis differently based on their skin color. They may very well have experienced things differently in that ED and simply asking, I see you've been to the emergency room twice in 24 hours. How do you, how do you, do you feel they listened to you while you were there? Do you feel your pain was believed? A lot of my patients, unfortunately, experience racism when they go to the doctor. Has that happened to you? Um, and opening that up to engage the patient. That challenges their right to comfort, it challenges defensiveness, which are things that support implicit racism at the bedside. So these are a few of the concrete observable skills. I did wanna to get to them because the, some questions were coming up and the students, I apologize that we're running out of time, but I think you know I'd love to open it up for any other questions or comments.